I want to do a problem, and I realize there are an awful lot of words here in this problem. It looks very, very long, but it's it's sort of useful to have just one setup that, that allows us to solve a whole bunch of different types of, of motion problems. So uh, let's suppose that a particle, we, we always refer to these problems as, as a particle. It, it doesn't really matter what the object is. I guess sometimes it's a rocket ship, uh, sometimes it's a car, sometimes it's a tennis ball. In its most uh, pure form, the problem is a particle. It's just a little dot that's moving to the right or to the left. So um, so if we suppose that a particle's displacement in meters is s of t equals the given function t cubed minus dot dot dot, whatever that says, uh, it's that number of meters at a time of t seconds. So you know, presuming that there's some origin here, we can calculate how many meters to the right of the origin the object is if we know how many seconds it's been since the start of time. And by the way, it's possible that we get a negative number. So if it's in, say, negative one meters to the right, that means that it's actually one meter to the left. You can interpret the number that way. So we're being asked to do a couple of things. Uh, first of all, find its velocity at t equals two. Um, I'm not going to read all these problems. We'll do them as they come up, but uh, I'll just keep referring back to this. So first of all, um, all right, let's find the velocity at t equals two. First thing we need is the velocity function, and this is why it's so, so, so important to understand that velocity is the derivative of position, and acceleration is the derivative of velocity is the second derivative of position. So part A, we need, to, we need the velocity function. This is something that sounds like, I, I realize this sounds a little bit like an excursion. This, this whole topic. We're not doing math, we're doing word problems. I know nobody likes word problems. I've taught this class enough times. The fact is that if there's one thing that I want you to take away from Calculus 1, it's the fact that by studying functions and their tendencies and their limits and their changes, which is what we do in Calculus, it's possible, it's possible to figure out from a position function what the velocity function is. In other words, by knowing not just individual values of the position, but by being able to look at the whole function, how does it move over time, it's this fact that enables us to look at a position function like s of t. I'm not saying that this is a correct drawing of s of t in this case. It's this fact that allows us to look at s of t and determine the velocity function from s of t. If all we could do is just say, is just look at a table and say, this is t and this is s, we couldn't really say anything about the velocity, but by looking at the curve, we can come up with a velocity function just from the position function itself. That's what derivatives are all about, and that's why we do calculus. That's why we don't just stop at algebra. Okay, sales pitch for calculus is over. v of t is the derivative of s of t, so I'm just going to read it right off using the, the derivative rules that we know. That's going to be 3t squared minus 2 times 6 times t, so that's 12t plus 9. I just applied the I applied the, the, the power rule for derivative multiple times along with the linearity rule. So we now have the, uh, we have the velocity function. So the question is, what is the velocity at t equals 2? Well, since we have a velocity function, we can simply plug in 2. That gives 3 times 2 squared is 4 minus 12 times 2 plus 9, so that's going to be 12 minus 24 plus 9, and that is negative 3, so negative 3 meters per second. What does that mean? It means the object is moving at 3 meters to the second, and it's going in the leftward direction. Its position is actually decreasing at that time. All right, b. What is its speed at t equals 2? Well, we know that speed is equal to the absolute value of velocity. So that means that that's going to equal, in this case, speed at t equals 2 is just going to equal the absolute value of the velocity at t equals 2. So 3 meters per second. And I just put that in that question in just to make sure that, uh, that I'm properly drawing the distinction between uh, velocity and speed. Um, OK. Next question, C. When does the particle become stationary for an instant? Stationary is a term that you're going to see in, in math probably from now on. The term stationary point it comes up quite frequently in calculus. What it refers to, stationary means there's no motion. The thing you have to understand about the idea, the idea of no motion is this. Is Let's suppose that I have a tennis ball and I throw it up in the air. It goes up to a certain point in height and then it comes down again. 
assuming I threw it straight up rather than straight up and forward, there's this point here, in time, there's this point right here where there's no motion, where the velocity is equal to zero. It has to be, because on this side, supposing that we, we consider up toward the sky now to be the positive direction of motion and we consider downward to be the negative direction, here the velocity is positive, it's greater than zero, and then here the velocity is less than zero, it's negative. So if that's the case, there must be some point in time when the velocity was actually zero. I mean, otherwise, you know, we would certainly see some very strange motion if the velocity could be positive and then immediately could be negative without ever having crossed through a velocity of zero. So we refer to this point when the velocity changes from positive to negative as a stationary point. In other words, this is a stationary point because the object, at least in one direction, is not moving, at least in the vertical direction. At this point here, just for an instant, it was not either moving up or down, it was just completely standing still. Now that instant was really an instant, it's like, you know, if you take any unit of time, even like point, even like a millionth of a second, there was some motion in that millionth of a second, but for that instant of time, that zero seconds, the, the, the object was actually moving at a speed of zero, so we call that stationary. So. This is what we're asking, is when does the particle become stationary for an instant? Well, to solve C, it's stationary when V equals zero. And fortunately, we have a velocity function. So all we have to do, excuse me, is solve for V of T equals zero and see what values of T that gives. Well, the velocity function we have from part A, so we have 3T squared minus 12T plus nine equals zero we're going to factor out a 3 and get t squared minus 4t plus 3 equals 0. If we factor that, that gives us t minus 1, t minus 3 equals 0. So the answer is at time t equals 1 second and t equals 3 seconds. So I guess a cleaner way to write that is t equals 1 and t equals 3. So those are the two times, those are the two instants in time when this object has, uh, has a velocity of 0 when it's stationary. Since we're talking about horizontal motion, what does that look like? I'll just do it here. What that means is that at time t equals, let's say that at time t equals 0, we're here. That means that at time t equals 1, the object comes to a complete stop here, stop. Now a couple of things might happen. The object might at this point, maybe it turns around and starts going the other way and that's why it stopped, or maybe it just stops and keeps going. We don't really know, but it, you know, the point is that it did come to a stop at that point. Let's say that it turns around, because actually that's what this object does. So it turns around and it keeps going until it gets, let's say, to here. It keeps going the other direction until t equals 3, and then it comes to a stop again and again, we don't really know for certain whether it just continues on in that direction after stopping or if it goes this way, but I'll tell you, actually, it, does, it, goes, it turns around again. So this is kind of what the path of the object looks like, but you can see what happens is at t equals 1, it stops. At t equals 3, it, it turns around. At t equals 3, it stops and turns around again. So, um, all right, so that's, those are the times when the object is stationary. Let's see what else we're being asked. What is the total distance traveled by the particle from t equals 0 to t equals 5? Let's actually bring, just bring our function down again so that we can, can answer that. So I'm just bringing down the, uh, the displacement function so we can use it. So it might be, it might seem appealing just to say, well, you know, the, the total distance traveled between t equals 0 and t equals 5 wouldn't that just be the displacement at 5 minus the displacement at 0? The problem with that is, imagine that the particle starts here at t equals 0. It goes out here to, let's say, t equals 1. And then let's say, you know, if we know that it turns around again at t equals 3. And then let's say at t equals 5, it's here. I'm not saying this is what it looks like, but let's just say it does. What you would conclude is that the object is in the same place at t equals 1 and t equals 5, and you'd conclude that it traveled no distance. But we can easily see that if we were an ant riding along on this particle, 
it's because I like to use ant analogies. What you can easily see is that this. Uh, it, what you can easily see is that the ant would certainly not conclude that it had traveled no distance. It would conclude that it went for a huge ride and then just came back home. So how do we deal with this fact? Some people say, oh, I know what it is. I must want the absolute value of the displacement. But keep in mind, the absolute, if we concluded that t equals zero, if we concluded, let's say, that s of 5 equals s of 0, then s of 5 minus s of 0 would still be 0, and its absolute value is 0. So that wouldn't solve the problem either. So this is not the way to solve this problem. What you want to do is you want to consider all the motion between stops. So what you want to do is consider, we already found where the object stops. We found that it stops at t, we, well, it starts at t equals 0. It does a stop at t equals 1. It does another stop at t equals 3. And then we want to know how, how far a total it's traveled between t equals 0 and t equals 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this up kind of into segments. We're going to ask how far the object traveled between t equals 0 and, and 1 then how far it traveled between t equals 0 and between 1 and 3, and then 3, how far it traveled between t equals 3 and t equals 5. So let's look at segment 1. Segment 1 is going to be s of 1 minus s of 0. Let's just, uh, let's calculate that. So s of 1 is equal to 1, square, one cubed, which is 1 minus 6 plus 9 plus 5. So that's going to be negative 5 and 9 is, sorry, that's negative 5 and 9 is 4 and 5 is 9. So this is 9. And s of 0 is, that's 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus 5. So what we can say is that s of 1 minus s of 0 is equal to 9 minus 5, which is equal to 4. I should point out that since we really don't care whether we're traveling, for when we're counting up total distance traveled, we're going to count distance to the right the same as we count distance to the left. So I'm going to put absolute values around this. It's not going to matter in this case because absolute value of 9 minus 5 is 4. So in segment 1, the total distance traveled was 4 meters. Now let's do 2. We need to subtract, we're going to find the absolute value of s of 3 minus s of 1 because we know that t equals 3 is a stopping point. So we want to know the distance the distance be traveled between t equals 3 and t equals 1. So we already have, uh, sorry, we, we already have um, s of 1 so I just need to calculate s of 3. That's going to be, need our function. So that's going to be 27 minus 6 times 9 is 54 plus 9 times 3 is 27 plus 5. There we go. So that is, is that right? Yeah. 18, 6 times 9 is 54. Nine times, yeah, that's correct. So this is just going to be 5. So s of 3 minus s of 1 is 5 minus 9. Good thing we have that absolute value. So that's the absolute value of negative 4, which is 4. Now let's do segment 3 which is going to be s of five, absolute value of s of 5 minus absolute value of s of 3. So that's going to give us, need our function again, that's going to be 5 cubed minus 6 times 5 squared plus 9 times 5 plus 5. So that's going to be 125 minus 6 times 25 is 150 plus 45 plus 5. So that's negative 25 and 45 is 20 and 5, which comes out to 25. So, sorry, this is what I calculated here was, let me just be clear what I'm calculating. What I'm calculating here is s of 5. So, absolute value of s of 5 minus absolute value of s of 3 is 25 minus 5, which is 20. So if I add up the total distance traveled in one in segments one, two, and three, what I get is four plus another four that comes from here, and then plus twenty. So that equals twenty-eight meters. That's the total distance traveled. All right. 
Let's do the last part of the problem. What is the particle's position when its acceleration is 6 meters per second squared? Okay, let me bring down the velocity function. We'll take the... Let me copy those. mistake. Copy. Up here where it belongs. There we go. Okay, so we have here, we have the position function and the velocity function. The question is, what is the particle's position when its acceleration is six meters per second? Okay, so we need to know its acceleration. Recall that acceleration is equal to the derivative of velocity which is also equal to the second derivative of position, since the velocity itself is just the derivative of position. So that's, uh, okay, so th let's find the derivative of the velocity function. So a of t is going to equal 2 times 3 times t, so that's 6t minus 12, and then the derivative of 9 is 0. So that's the acceleration function. Label this as part e of the problem. So 6t minus 12. The question was when the velocity is 6. So I'm sorry, when the acceleration is 6. So when is 6t minus 12 equal to 6? That's going to be true when 6t is equal, move the 12 over to the other side. So when 6t equals 18. And finally, that gives us t equals 3. So the acceleration, the, the acceleration is 6 when the time is 3. Well, the question is, what is the particle's position when the acceleration is... What is the particle's position or displacement when the acceleration is 6? Well, when the acceleration is 6, the time is 3, so to get the position at time equals 3, we simply calculate s of 3. We had actually done that up here as part of this calculation, and the answer is s of t equals 5 equals 5 meters because we already calculated s of 3 up here as part of another problem. So there we go. That's a lot of different questions that you can ask, but keep in mind how far we were able to get with this because if you look at, sorry, I don't know why my keyboard, my on-screen keyboard is going crazy. If you look at the original setup for the problem, the only thing that we were given about this particle is its position function and we were able to answer all sorts of questions. How far does it travel? What is its acceleration? When does it stop? What is its velocity at such and such time? We were able to answer all these questions from nothing but the position function. That's what this section is really all about, is about this relationship between velocity, position, and acceleration.